they're thinking. And then I'll give you the okay sign when we're live. Okay. <laughs> Right. right, hello, hello. and welcome, welcome to this awful, awful did, did, sorry, sorry, also, also digital, digital event, event, which we, which are, we are doing with Dr. Susie Gage, who's the author of a new, of a new book, book, Say White Drugs. Drugs. Dr. Dr. Susie is a senior, senior lecturer and well trust, trust engagement fellow at the University, University of Liverpool. Of Liverpool. As well as, as well her research, research exploring, exploring the link between, between recreational, recreational drug, drug use and mental health, Susie is an award-winning science writer and podcaster. Her podcast exploring the science around recreational drugs has well over a million listeners, and she has just published her first book. Which, which is, is they wife drugs, drugs, which we're going to be talking, talking about, about today. today. So, so Susie, Susie, welcome. welcome. Hi. How are you doing, How are you doing this Saturday? Saturday? Good. It's very exciting to be doing this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really, really excited, excited to have, to have you. you. So, so I guess, I guess the, first the first question, question I have about this book, book is, is what, what do you mean, mean by drugs? drugs? It's a really good question because there are lots of sort of lots of different ways we can think about drugs but in the book I'm specifically thinking about psychoactive substances so these are substances that you take and they have some impact on your brain your mood your perception potentially um, that kind of thing so some of those might be drugs that we think of as recreational drugs and the, and the book is really talking about recreational drug use but some of those same substances are also medications as well so things like morphine being very similar to heroin or ketamine which is on the world health organization right. list of essential medicines but also drugs that that people might use recreationally so some that you might not think of as drugs like alcohol or caffeine even so can, can we, we use the term, term drug, drug and, and psychoactive, psychoactive substance interchangeably, interchangeably? Well, there are also uh, like there are other types of drugs as well. So sort of medications that we might take for various things that don't right, have right. a psychoactive effect would also be called drugs. But for the for the for the sake of the book, by drugs I mean sort of drugs like we think of as sort of illicit drugs, but also drugs like alcohol, caffeine, tobacco that are legal but also used recreationally. Okay, okay that, that makes sense. sense. So, so what, what I think, I think is, so is so wonderful about this book is the fact, is the fact that, that it's basically a manual, manual to every drug, drug that, we that we have in our society, society whether, it's whether it's illegal, illegal or, not. or not. And, and you, you go through it alphabetically, don't you, to kind of describe, describe the properties of it, it, the impact it has on you, do some great myth-busting around it. I wanted, I wanted to start, start with alcohol, alcohol actually, because it's a drug most people have got experience of. What are some of the most common misconceptions people have about it? I think there are loads. I think maybe the most common one is that it's not a drug. Like lots of people, when you talk about drugs, and actually it's true in academia as well, there are scientific journals that are called sort of drug and alcohol use and things like that. We oh, sort really? of separate alcohol out as if it's something different. But actually alcohol is not just a drug, but it's a particularly kind of high impact drug in a way. So lots of psychoactive substances have influence on different neurotransmitters in our brain. So these are the chemicals that pass signal between your brain cells. So your brain cells don't actually connect. There's a little gap between them. And so when signals are passed down your brain cell, a chemical is released, which sends the message and sort of stimulates the next brain cell and the message carries on. And there are various different neurotransmitters in the brain that all do different things. So you might have heard of dopamine or serotonin, GABA, there's, there's loads of them. And lots of psychoactive substances might have a particular impact on maybe one or two of these neurotransmitters. But alcohol is a really kind of global drug in the brain and it impacts on almost all of our neurotransmitters. It has loads of different sort of contradictory effects. It might make you feel sort of more awake and alert if you have a little bit, but then it can make you really sleepy. It can impact on your ability to do fine motor tasks. It can um, it can impact on your sort of judgment and it might make you more prone to sort of do silly things or not think about the consequences, but it can also make you feel really relaxed and social and that kind of thing. So it has a huge number of different effects on us. It really does impact our mood, it impacts our perception, but lots of people don't even really think of it as a drug. <laughs> 
and I find that I find that really fascinating and it's I'm kind of on a one woman well not one woman there are lots of people saying this but a quest to really make people understand that alcohol is a drug just the same as MDMA is a drug or cannabis is a drug why, Why do you, do you think, think alcohol, alcohol has become, become the most, the most acceptable, acceptable drug, drug across, across cultures? cultures? Or maybe, or maybe it hasn't actually been cultures, 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 the kind of drug of choice, particularly in the UK and, as you say, in lots of other sort of Western cultures as well. And I think there's probably lots of reasons, and there are people far better qualified to answer this question than me, but there is, there's definitely um, the sort of historical aspect that water at some point wasn't particularly kind of clean and so doing something to it might be helpful. Uh, there's a, an, a, I think it's probably an apocryphal tale um, but when cholera broke out in London and John Snow, who is sort of sometimes seen as the, the forefather of epidemiology, which is the type of research that I do, um, was trying to understand, they didn't, people didn't know how cholera was spread at the time. And he, um, which is another apocryphal tale actually, is that he took the handle off a water pump and um, in Soho and lots of people stopped getting ill. Um, it wasn't quite, the story didn't quite happen like that. But there's another part of that story that says there was one factory where no one got ill and that was the brewery because everyone was drinking the beer rather right. than going to the water tap. So I, I don't think that's true, but there is kind of an element of, I don't want to say truthiness because that's a bit woo, but you know, this, this kind of idea that doing something to the water sort of, um, to make it, to, to get rid of any potential bugs that might be in it. And, and alcohol, so beer was much weaker back in sort of, I think, I think medieval times and, and later, that actually it was, it was drunk by people and children as well, mm -hmm. as kind of the, the drink of choice. So I think history has a lot to do with it as well, that it was kind of easy to create, you could make it yourself, um, it was it didn't it wasn't something that was kind of synthesized in a lab or anything like that it was something that you could make it kind of it makes itself if you just leave rotting whatever and fermenting things which kind of alcohol is created um but i think there's also probably a lot of politics involved as well into why it became the, the sort of drug of choice that it is now and, and in the, in the section, section on alcohol, alcohol though, you, do you do some really, really good myth busting. Uh, one, of one of the things, the things you, talk you talk about is the fact that, that actually, actually the day after you had, had some drinks, drinks you, will you will still feel the effect of the alcohol, alcohol and it's still affecting your kind of, kind of well, what's, well, what's going, going on in your brain. Your brain. Why, do Why do you think people underestimate its impact on them? Well, we all, I mean, we've all, well, lots of us have probably experienced hangovers. So we kind of know that we don't feel ourselves the next day. But because a, a breathalyzer won't detect alcohol and it won't necessarily be um, even in your blood for that long a period of time, I think it was just sort of assumed that, yeah, you might feel a bit rough, but that's just kind of the after effects is probably fine. But um, a good friend of mine and colleague, Dr. Sally Adams, who's at the University of Bath, um, has started doing a lot of research into hangovers. and. It's her research that's found that actually things things are really quite impaired after the day after. So things like driving or operating machinery, um, potentially we shouldn't be doing this if we if we're really quite hungover. But one thing she's found is that researching hangovers is really really tricky because I mean, can you imagine if you if you are feeling really rough, the thought of trying to get up and go to a lab and do an experiment just isn't going to be high up your list. Your list is going to be fry up tv fizzy drink maybe <laughs> it's not yeah. yeah go and do a driving simulation for a researcher <laughs> Please, yeah, i'm just gonna pause you one second, second because apparently, apparently we're having a microphone, microphone issue, issue. Thirdly, Thirdly, do you have you your have phone, phone to hand? Yeah. can you just, can you just check, check your, your whatsapp, WhatsApp message? message sorry, sorry Steve, this. This. I, just I just don't want, don't want people not to be able to hear us properly yeah do you think i need my headphones or is it not quite. I, don't I don't know. know. I, just I just saw it on my iPad. There's two, two mics, mics on, I think. think. Um, you get an echo. Um, 
Can you, Can you hear, hear that, that better, better now? now? That's, That's better. better. See, See, you can you still, still hear me? me? I can still hear you fine, yeah. Okay, okay, okay perfect. All right, that's, All right, right. that's right. Let's carry on, on now. I was getting I was an echo in my ear. I wonder if it's just, just my headphones. Head okay, okay, brilliant. brilliant. Um, um, so, so, can we can talk, we talk about, about cannabis? Because, because I think, I think that's, that's probably, probably the illegal drug that most people, people have most experience, experience of, even, even if they haven't personally taken it, they know what people have, and there's so much so in the press about it. Is it really the gateway drug that people make it out to be? Oh, it's a really good question. So I did my PhD looking at, um, well, cannabis and tobacco use and its links with mental health, trying to understand whether those are causal links. And a colleague of mine, Michelle Taylor, was doing her PhD exploring whether cannabis was the gateway drug that it's sort of stated to be. And I think cannabis is quite often a substance that is tried earlier than other illicit substances because it's sort of got a reputation as being less sort of extreme than doing a, like a class A drug, I guess the class system kind of, it was a, a class C drug and then a class B drug and it's been kind of moved around between those two, but maybe it's seen as a little bit less risky than doing something like MDMA or yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that. Um, but whether it's actually a gateway drug itself, I you know, I think people are far more likely to have smoked a cigarette or drunk alcohol before they ever use cannabis. But you don't really hear them being called gateway drugs. Mm. And maybe it's something to do with stepping from doing something that's kind of socially OK, even if you're doing it underage, like alcohol or tobacco use underage, it's still a substance that is sort of you can buy it in shops. It's regulated, but it is legal, whereas something like cannabis, you have to move into kind of the illicit drug market. You might then be exposing yourself to um, criminals potentially uh, depending on who you're buying it from or opening yourself up to being in situations where other substances are available so in that regard the sort of social or cultural aspect of it maybe it is a gateway drug but I don't think there's anything sort of biological or specific to cannabis that makes it a gateway drug yeah that makes a lot of sense why I do can't you... hear you anymore oh sorry one second Sorry, Sorry, Susan, can you hear me, me now? now? I can, yeah. Uh, uh, just go, Susan. Uh, she, she can't, can't hear me, though. Oh, oh, hang, hang on. on. Susan, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Okay, we've got there. Brilliant. <laughs> okay. Why do you think there is so much, I don't know, discussion around cannabis and so certain social groups that use it? And do you think that, that it's very political, the positioning of it? I do think so. Yeah, I think and I think that's true of all sorts of other substances as well. I mean, maybe even more pronounced with things like cocaine compared with powder cocaine to crack cocaine. But for cannabis as well, it does seem to be certain demographics that are particularly targeted when it comes to policing of cannabis use. And certain groups are particularly vulnerable to the kind of criminal um, aspects of it in terms of um, gangs and county lines and that sort of thing and again this is a little bit outside of my area of expertise but um, it does certainly seem I mean all substance use is quite political really but um, yeah cannabis I mean cannabis is used by a lot of different demographics and, and there's certainly much higher risk of punitive response to it if you're in one demographic compared to another. Yeah, I think that's definitely true too, working as a journalist and seeing the stories that come through about it. So the other thing I wanted to move on to is psychedelics, because obviously there's lots of different drugs that have psychedelic effects on us. And there's a kind of increasing discussion around some of the positive effects of taking psychedelics in controlled amounts and in laboratory settings. Is that research really as important as it's been made out to be in the media or is it kind of a trend that they've sort of taken hold of um i think a bit of both you know i think there's some really really interesting research going on but i also think a lot of it makes it to headlines well before it's kind of as far through the research process as would normally happen for something that's maybe not quite as sexy a subject as giving people psychedelics to treat depression or to treat addiction or to treat uh, cluster headaches or all sorts of things that the, that these substances are being researched 
but I do think the research is really really interesting and there is some and it's it, I mean, it is quite cool. And, and the brain scan studies that are happening, trying to explore what a psychedelic experience is, because one of the things that's really striking about pretty much all psych psychoactive substances, but psychedelics in particular, is how subjective the experience is. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's true. It's true of alcohol as well, that kind of the mood that you're in and who you're with and all this kind of thing. It, it's quite often known as set and setting has a huge impact on the type of intoxication experience you'll have. But with something like a psychedelic where it kind of really, really interferes with your perception, um, that subjective effect is, is, is even more pronounced. So there's a really interesting book about DMT. And in the introduction to that book, um, the author talks about Think about how you would feel if you were given a holy sacrament by a shaman compared to how you'd feel if you were given a medical um, substance by a doctor versus how you would feel if you were given a psychedelic at a rave. And you'd have hugely different expectations in each of those situations. And that would, of course, really impact on your psychedelic experience. So trying to kind of nail down the um, neural kind of connectivity or impact of a psychedelic experience and really link that to the subjective perceptual changes and all of these kind of things mood changes that you experience if you take a psychedelic i find that really really fascinating and i think the potential for these things to be useful as they're not therapies in and of themselves they are being employed as part of kind of a talking therapy and um, so I think that's something that quite often gets maybe missed in in the media hype around it. It's not a case of go and drop acid and, and you'll recover from depression. It's it's a really it's a sort of detailed process that happens. And you'll see your therapist many, many times before you have your psychedelic experience. And it's usually psilocybin, which is the active compound in magic mushrooms. Um, but ketamine is also being investigated. MDMA, which has kind of psychedelic E mm -hmm. effects. Um, I didn't mean that pun on E then, by the way, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you just came out with it, it's brilliant. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, and so you won't have the psychedelic experience until you've built up this relationship with your therapist and got to a state where they deem it to be appropriate. So it's not a kind of quick fix. And I think that's really important that it's hard enough at the moment to get a talking therapy for mental health problems that the chances of us getting psilocybin on the NHS anytime soon, I think, are probably very small, even if these trials are really fantastic, just because it's it's a really intensive process to go through this therapy. Yeah. So I suppose one of the problems with that and this kind of media reporting is that people will be taking substances themselves in an uncontrolled setting and thinking, well, this is going to cure my depression or my anxiety and I don't need to maybe stay on other kinds of medication or don't need to talk to anybody about my problems. You say in the book that buying illegal drugs or taking illegal drugs that you've bought is a bit like buying a lottery ticket. Is it really um, that random, the quality of what people are getting? Well, there are, there are groups kind of investigating this. And um, I, if you've been to some music festivals and, and other places over the last few years, you might have seen The Loop at some of them. And they're an organisation who do drug testing at festivals and they've also done city centre testing as well and what they find is um that yeah it's i think it's particularly true where a substance is a powder or a tablet that there is a huge amount of variation in the strength of what you are buying or taking um the purity maybe isn't quite the right word but whether it contains any other substances potentially different psychoactive substances or other things as well i mean there's sort of sort of, sort of urban myths that there's always rat poison in these kind of things i think things like that are probably pretty unlikely but then being bulked up with sort of sugar or flour or you know anything like that i think that's not uncommon um but then the problem at the moment seems to be kind of the opposite that that cocaine and MDMA in particular seem to be sure. 
often or not quite often but you know sometimes can end up having far more than you mean to and feeling the ill effects of that and it's just amplifying that risk where there's no regulation or quality control um on illicit products that makes perfect sense so i wanted to ask you about addictions susie because you say in the book that there's something above and beyond brain chemical changes which leads to addiction so what is that i mean that's a really good question that you're using it even when you know there are actual or potential harms that you're going to experience from continuing to do so it's moved from a want to a need and it's potentially knocked other parts of your life off kilter so that could be your relationships with your friends and family your employment or um or your ability to um to sort of maintain your life on the course that you want it to be going on and there are lots of potential reasons as to why people might, might like become addicted or dependent on a substance um but we i don't think we know just sort of definitively that like so if, if if you have this particular type of genetics and x y and z happens to you then you will develop addiction it's not as straightforward as that but it does seem like the more kind of difficulties are thrown at you the the easier it is to kind of or the more appealing it is to turn to a substance to kind of ease some of that difficulty and when you start to it's actually quite detrimental Susie, i'm just going to pause for one second is our sound okay okay just double checking that okay so a lot of the myths around drugs that you expel in the book seem not to be so much generated by, say, urban myth, but actually by some experts putting forward their own theories about drugs. There's lots of research that you mentioned in the book where somebody's kind of come up with a hypothesis afterwards, but it hasn't been properly researched. And then that takes hold. What does research need in order for that not to happen? Or is that just kind of part of the process of investigating? I think it's probably a combination of different things like that's kind of how research works is that you come up with an idea and you test it and see whether it works but because drug use is such an inter interesting topic and people are like it makes really good headlines that I think often things do get picked up and kind of disseminated quite widely before they're really really well understood and that's kind of how some of these some of these stranger ideas get spread <laughs> um, so I'm not, I think it would be really helpful if research could happen a bit more easily because it's very difficult to conduct research looking at particularly illicit drugs. People don't necessarily, don't necessarily feel comfortable being honest about their substance use. And also this issue that we've talked about already that people might think they've taken one particular thing and then had this experience, but actually maybe they didn't. Maybe mm. what they thought was one thing was actually something else. So you've got that added problem in as well. And um, so cannabis research is something I'm particularly interested in. And what we've seen a lot of in recent years is trying to unpick the impact of various different cannabinoids. So these are kind of the active compounds in cannabis and there are hundreds of them. Um, trying to work out whether it, though different cannabinoids have different impacts so THC is one that you might have heard of yeah. and there's growing evidence that uh, higher rates of THC might be particularly risky um, in terms of risk of things like psychosis um, but another cannabinoid that's really made a lot of headlines recently is cannabidiol or CBD and this one um, there's some evidence that actually it might be protective and over recent sort of years and decades, the kind of ratio between THC and CBD in cannabis that's been seized on the streets does seem to have shifted. And THC seems to have gone up while CBD in, in lots of 
strains of cannabis seems to have really, really gone down to be almost non-existent. And some people are saying, well, maybe that's why we're seeing, um, or that makes it particularly risky for developing psychosis. But actually, I don't think we know enough yet. And if that was the case, then the research that first found the link between cannabis and psychosis, which was conducted in the 60s, uh, wouldn't have found it because back then the ratio was much more even. So, you know, there's, there's more going on than just that. But understanding more about these different cannabinoids could be really, really useful. And CBD is now being investigated for all sorts of things. And obviously has appeared in high streets, sort of health food shops, um, hummus and ice cream. I, I saw a CBD Christmas pudding advertised last year. <laughs> Did you not? <laughs> um, and so that's also, an, it's kind of taken on a life of its own as this kind of wellness product. But it's also making headlines as a research product and, and um, a, a medicine in particular around childhood epilepsy. There's been a lot of headlines about the, the use of CBD um, to treat that. But what, what tends to get missed from this is that the CBD that you would be given in a clinical trial is orders of magnitude stronger than what you can buy in health food shops. So right. if you try CBD that you get from sort of from on the street or around the corner, <laughs> not on the street, but you know what I mean. Um, I don't want to name a particular health food shop. Sure. Until, like, <laughs> but, but you might try it and find it has no effect. And that might make you think, oh, well, um, I, I wouldn't take part in a clinical trial then. But actually, it could just be that the dose was far too low. So it's it's having this kind of dual life as a kind of wellness product and a potential medicine could potentially be detrimental. Hmm. I've never really thought about like that before, actually. So how difficult is it to be a drugs researcher practically, Susie, in terms of perhaps government policy, access to funding? We've mentioned there the fact that um, people aren't always honest about their drug use, so that makes it tricky. What, what are the biggest problems politically for it? Well, the type of research that I do isn't so much hindered by sort of home office licenses because I don't I don't give people a substance and then investigate them I'm I'm an epidemiologist so I look at large sort of large data sets and look at kind of patterns in population health so the difficulty for me is that um, if you want to understand whether cannabis causes psychosis in a kind of ideal world what you would want to do would be to take a group of teenagers who've never never taken any substance and randomly assign half of them to use cannabis throughout their adolescence and half of them not to and follow them up over time and compare the numbers who develop psychosis in both groups. Now, obviously that's completely unethical and impractical for multitude of reasons. So the way that we have to do it is to watch what people choose to do. And the people who choose to use cannabis are going to be different from the people who choose not to in lots of ways other than their cannabis use so they might have different friendship groups they might be different socioeconomic status and again I'm not talking about individuals here I'm talking about as an average so there's always going to be people who kind of buck the trends but overall there are going there might be systematic differences between these groups and so you have to try and a know what those differences are and b take them into account in your kind of statistical modeling and that's doable but it's not easy and you can never be a hundred percent sure that you've taken into account everything and measured it well enough to include it in your models and not have any kind of we call it confounding so not have any residual confounding left in your in your model and it's something that's been seen in this kind of observational epidemiology and loads and loads of different areas that people have done loads of really consistent observational studies that have all found the same thing and when you move that into a clinical trial, it doesn't work because there was a factor that wasn't taken into account right. well enough. And so that's kind of the really difficult thing of, we see quite consistently that heavy sort of daily cannabis use, particularly high potent, high THC cannabis is associated with an increase in risk of psychosis. Mm. But it's, it's still really hard to say that it definitely is a causal factor because we know that lots of people use cannabis and not many people develop psychosis yeah. so it's not necessary or sufficient but it could be that for certain groups of people who have other risk factors as well that 
that cannabis might be one of these risk factors that might kind of tip the scales. So it's really, really hard to unpick. And also we've got such a poor understanding of complex mental health problems like psychosis, that this adds another complication on top of it as well, that actually, but certainly with terms like schizophrenia, I think it's quite possible that not in not too distant future, we'll look back and think, why did we ever think schizophrenia was one particular illness? There are so, mm -hmm. two people can have a diagnosis of schizophrenia and not have any overlapping symptoms at okay. all. So yeah, it's really, it's really challenging in that regard, <laughs> regardless of the politics of doing it and getting funding and that kind of thing. It's difficult enough anyway. <laughs> Well, I'm gonna ask you just a couple more questions, Susie, but I just wanted to talk to our stream and say to people, if you're watching, you can actually ask Susie a question. All you have to do is just tap in the comments and we will ask her. So if you want to ask her anything at all about drugs, please go ahead and do that now. I'm gonna to chat to her for a bit longer, but if you do ask her something, I will make sure to ask her. So when you were writing this book, Susie, what was the most difficult thing about it? Was it condensing the information? Um, was it known what to leave out? Yeah, I think um, because I really wanted to make sure. So the whole Say Why to Drugs concept started as the podcast, as a way of getting non-judgmental, evidence-based information about drugs in a kind of accessible format. And so when I started writing the book, because I wanted to make sure I included the impact of each or like the what we know about the effects of each substance at some points I was worried it can, it can get a little bit repetitive because obviously there is there are substances in the book that are quite similar to each other so it was trying to make sure that it was getting the information in there but still in a really in a really interesting and enjoyable to read kind of way and I think that for me the way I did that was to learn more about the bits of the of the Sort of, of the drug that I didn't know. So the history of how the drug was developed and sort of who used them, particularly substances that aren't necessarily used very much in the UK, but are used in lots of other parts of the world is reading about those kind of things and adding in at least a few paragraphs about the history of the substance was, I found it fascinating to research. Anyway, I hope people find it interesting to read. Um, and also including um, more general chapters as well as having specific chapters about each individual substance sort of thinking about well how do drugs affect the brain and what do we know about the links between substance use psychoactive substance use and mental health and and thinking about the different categories of drugs so not all of not all psychoactive substances fit into a category but there are certain drugs that are all stimulants certain drugs that are depressants or psychedelics and then there are sort of other substances that are kind of fit between them like mdma has psychedelic like effects but it's also a bit of a stimulant it doesn't quite fit and cannabis again can have psychoactive sort of psychedelic effects for some people um but also uh kind of fits in its own category in terms of what we know about how its action on the brain and that sort of thing so trying to kind of add in that kind of information as well yeah well like I said I found the whole thing fascinating and there was so much in there that I absolutely didn't know what are you going to go and do next with your research so I'm doing quite a lot of research at the moment um with colleagues at Liverpool John Moores and York looking at the relationship between um or the public perception of drug use and stigma which is something that I'm really, really interested in. And, and while writing the book, it kind of became apparent to me that there's, there's so much, there's so much stigma around. And a lot of it is, it comes from a place of not really understanding about substances and, and particularly around addiction, I think there's a lot of stigma and that stigma has real world consequences as well. And there's research that suggests that, um, that the language that we use impacts on stigma but also on whether people believe it's someone's fault that they've developed addiction and whether they believe that they should have more punitive punishment for um for whatever situation that they're in so it's it's really important to kind of better understand um this aspect of stigma and also um 
I do a lot of public engagement work. I'm currently a Wellcome Trust public engagement fellow. And so as part of that, I think disseminating this information and thinking about well, if there is this stigma and it has this effect, then what can we do to kind of minimize it or improve the situation for people who are dealing with really, really difficult situations in their life, usually before they develop a substance use problem as well. Um, and kind of thinking about these kind of things as a health issue rather than a criminal issue and helping people to get the support that they need rather than piling punishment upon punishment. That makes a lot of sense. So I'm just talking to you again, viewers. If you want to ask Susie anything, we've got about 15 minutes to do so. So please type your questions on the stream um, and we'll endeavor to get those answered for you. Susie, while I remember, could you show us what your book looks like? Because we are actually selling it today on the Also Festival website. There we go. So that's Susie's book, Say Why to Drugs. And you can buy that today. And please buy it from us, rather one of the big suppliers, because it's much better for the book industry. <laughs> so Susie, when you were writing this book, did you have anybody, um, when you told them about what you were doing, if you did, I don't know if you did, and if you kept it a secret, but did you have people come out with their own stories when, I imagine that happens to you a lot, right? People give you their anecdotes about their crazy wild nights when they were taking mushrooms or something? Well, ever since I started um, doing my PhD way back in, I think 2009, um, looking at cannabis and psychosis, it's something that people have really strong opinions of and usually very polarized opinions because people will either say, cannabis is no worse than drinking tea. It's ridiculous that, that um, it's illegal and it, everything should be legalized now. But you also speak to people who say, my brother's friend um, smoked weed every day in his teenage years and had to be sectioned and um, cannabis is awful. And but, but sort of both of those things are, are true for different groups of people. And so it's, it's a really, really interesting topic to research. But actually I found that um, I think it's really, really important to get people's lived experience um, on all sides of the spectrum uh, as well as the science, I think it would be a very dry book if it was just, and this drug does this, and this drug does that. So I actually, I spoke to loads of people, some of whom I knew and some of whom I didn't, about their use of various different substances to get some kind of real world perspective. And I think that's why the Say Why to Drugs podcast works so well, because I present it with Scroobius Pip, who is an actor and podcaster and rapper and multi-talented man. Um, but he is very open about talking about his experiences and those of his friends and people that he knows and that kind of thing. Um, and getting that lived experience alongside what we know about the evidence base, mm -hmm. I think is really valuable. And, and it's something that because I obviously yeah, do a lot of public engagement and science communication. It's something that I think can't be underestimated. As a, as a kind of expert and researcher, I've got a level of credibility, but that kind of goes away if you ignore what people actually experience when they do something and their kind of their testimony. So I really want to always make sure I, I include that in whatever I'm doing. So I love chatting to people about drugs as well. <laughs> I can just imagine people always giving you these stories and you thinking, oh, here we go again. But I suppose it's all valuable. It's really great. And to be honest, I learned so much from people who aren't scientists talking to me about things like this. And I've genuinely come up with grant applications from the Q&As after giving talks and that kind of thing. Because people think about questions in a completely different way. And so the wider, the more diverse kind of um input you can get the better ideas that you'll come up with so yeah I think it's great in terms of being uh so public engagement focused again do you think that the mood around drugs is shifting and is it around just some drugs or are we living through a um I don't know a more conservative time around certain substances what's the kind of political mood at the moment I think that's a really good question and um if you'd have asked me five years ago whether I thought cannabis would be legalised in the UK in my lifetime, I would have probably said, I think that's really unlikely. Okay. But now looking around the world and seeing how cannabis is being treated in countries like the US and Canada and Uruguay and loads of other places, I'm maybe changing my mind on that. Um, to me, it feels like since I started working in this field in 2009, that 
media reporting around drugs has really changed but I don't know whether that's just because I'm far more aware of it because I work in in the field but I, I, I do think there is a shift I think so actually it was a Liverpool taxi driver said to me um, I think cannabis will be legalized and do you know why the Gavin and Stacey Christmas special and <laughs> I thought that was really <laughs> That's interesting. The fact that cannabis use or illicit substance use in that episode was portrayed as something that kind of middle-aged, middle England people do and kind of as a sort of really not really seeing any difference between that and alcohol. And it is a very different way to portray. I think maybe more impactful than news headlines is how it's portrayed in things like soap operas and comedy mm. and and kind of that that way that we imbibe culture so I think he's got a point <laughs> <laughs> I really like that being the the anecdote that he gave you I know. <laughs> so what is your hope with this book Susie I think it's it's it can have a few different uh roles I really hope that people find it interesting first of all but I think there's a few different types of people who might read it um certainly from speaking to people on Twitter and things who have read it parents of teenagers mm -hmm. are finding it really useful as something to read themselves but also to sort of leave around the house to kind of um say I, I we can talk about this if you want kind of thing but if you don't want to talk to me then have a look at this anyway um and I think so I think teenagers and their parents are quite a big readership for it and that was the initial aim of the podcast was to be aimed at teenagers and yeah. it, they're not necessarily an easy group for a 37 36 year old to reach but <laughs> um, yeah I think I you've do done that best. really well in the book I think I'll, to say to the audience what is so great about this book is that it's non-judgmental but it's completely factual and when you read it you don't get a sense of having any judgment from the from Susie herself you just get a sense of being taught the facts about things in a way that we've never been taught them before and I really love Susie the way you end up each section with the myth but myth busting section because I think probably at least half of those myths I believe too even things about alcohol that thing people say about um orange juice if you're on if you're on LSD take some orange juice to come out of a trip I mean I I've heard loads of people say that so I was particularly fascinated by these little tidbits <laughs> yeah I mean I believed lots of them too until I actually looked into them really? I think yeah. they are really sort of yeah they they kind of have this element of truthiness about them that makes you think oh well that's that sounds like it makes sense so it probably does yeah. but actually when you look at the evidence you're like oh no <laughs> <laughs> or just that there isn't any evidence and things that we think yeah. of as really clear cut are far more grey yeah that one of the um, things you explore actually around psychedelics, I just want to come back to it because it's really fascinating, is this theory that, is it mushrooms helped humans develop out of the Stone Age? Yeah, yeah, it's called the Stoned Ape Hypothesis. Right. And I, I, similarly, I find it really fascinating because it's sort of, you can go, oh yeah, wow, take a psychedelic. You just find it, you're foraging and you find it and you're this, yeah, this ape prehistoric ape and you try it and you go oh wow my I can I can talk and I can think and and um it's a really kind of appealing idea but um there's various reasons why this particular person I can't remember his name now there's probably people shouting it at the screen because he's really famous <laughs> but um that his his particular theory of how it might have happened doesn't make sense for a few reasons there are certain things that he says about how it would impact vision that we know aren't the case and um the way it would impact on um, sexual relations was one of the other things that he thought that mushrooms might change those kind of dynamics within a group and and change the sort of social structure but the evidence for that in from sort of historical uh, research and archaeology is pretty pretty thin on the ground that doesn't necessarily back up what he says but it is it's an idea that has such it, it makes so much sense that you <laughs> yeah. sort of and it's quite romantic and you quite like it to be true but um yeah the evidence doesn't necessarily back it up <laughs> okay <Sorry>. good to know <laughs>
So we're nearing the end of our session with Susie. If you've got anything to ask her, I know it can be a bit scary asking questions, especially around this topic, but there's no judgment here and um, you don't need to use your real name and all that kind of thing. Um, the other thing that I wanted to ask you about, Susie, one of the other myths you mentioned in the book is this idea that Queen Victoria used to take cannabis for her period pain, for her period pains, I think? Period pains and pains in childbirth. Ah, were. pains in childbirth as well. Yeah. And you dismiss that, don't you? Well she might have done okay there's certainly a physician that she was associated with used to prescribe it to some people but right. um i think the timeline doesn't quite match up that he was he was working for her at the wrong time period or it doesn't yeah there's no actual evidence that she ever did but it was something that was um prescribed for those kind of things in the victorian era as this kind of tincture of cannabis so cannabis sort of dissolved in alcohol and in fact cannabis was a really um common pain medication back then and it only really fell out of favor when the syringe was invented because it's too it was a too much too complex a molecule to be injected so oh, okay. other pain medications that were better in injections things like morphine and that sort of thing became more um sort of rose to prominence a bit more but it's it's I find things like that fascinating how it can go from being a widely used medicine to being an illicit drug and potentially now it's come full circle and is coming back yeah. to be certainly some sort of extracts from it are being considered as a potential medicine again yeah and Susie I think probably the last question that I want to ask you it's quite a straightforward one or maybe it isn't actually maybe that's me <laughs> oversimplifying it um what is the most dangerous drug uh, I mean, yeah, as you say, it sounds like a simple question, but there are so many kind of ifs and buts. I think if you're talking about the substance that kills the most people, then it's probably tobacco, cigarettes. Right. And to be honest, alcohol is probably up there. But then these are also two of the most commonly used substances. So alcohol, for example, it's not just the substance itself that if you are a an, a heavy alcohol user over many years then the risks to your health in terms of liver disease cancer so, uh, this is a really downer to end this I'm really sorry everyone <laughs> um, but uh, yeah you know the risks to your physical health and your mental health we kind of know a bit about the risks of alcohol but also alcohol is responsible for road traffic accidents it's responsible for people um, having accidents themselves while they're intoxicated and um, it's responsible for unwanted pregnancies. It's responsible for all sorts of things. So there's kind of the harms to the self, but also societal harms. And alcohol really does score very highly on these kind of um, scales. I think Professor David Nutt and colleagues um, conducted a, um, a sort of survey among different researchers who were um, categorizing different substances in terms of their harms and alcohol if you can if you combine harms to, to the self and harms to society was the highest scorer even above heroin which is something that's sort of thought of as a particularly harmful substance um partly i think because it's just used by so many people and it, ha it because it's so embedded in our society it has huge impacts on our society mm. so if there's one thing you want people to understand Susie that you think is just commonly misunderstood or misrepresented about drugs what would it be alcohol's a drug right <laughs> um there I mean there are loads but that's the one that I think would help people to understand other drugs much better if you if people were more commonly thought of alcohol as a drug it would make the leap to thinking about other drugs more easier to manage and sort of maybe increase empathy and that kind of thing as well okay well I think we're gonna to have to leave it there Susie it's been absolutely fascinating would you show us your book one more time so we can just show the audience. Thank, you. thank you so much it's been really really great talking to you as well oh that's it's my been brilliant there we go everyone so that's say why to drugs you can buy it now in the also bookshop and Susie where's your podcast available it's available anywhere where you get podcasts. It's on um, Apple Podcasts and Acast and Spotify. And, and that's called Say White Drugs as well. Also called Say White Drugs because I'm very original. <laughs> <laughs> no, if it's short and it delivers, it's absolutely perfect. Thanks so much, Susie. Take care and have a great rest of the festival. Oh, thanks. Bye. Bye.
Thanks a lot, crew, for watching. If you are around tomorrow, I'm doing a really great session with an author called Gemma Milne. It's a book called Smoke and Mirrors, and it's about the hype that's built around science. So that's at 11.15 tomorrow, so come and tune into that if you want to watch that. Uh, have a great festival, and we'll see you later.